Good evening, everyone, and uh, thank you for being here. I'm delighted to moderate this panel on competition policy. I am Tommaso Valletti, and I am the uh, director of the um, RPN, CPR RPN on competition policy. So competition policy is um, pretty hot in recent years, uh, both in terms of policy and in terms of academic research. Um, in particular, academic research, obviously, competition policy is a quintessential field of, of industrial organization, but there has been lots of um, interventions from other fields in economics, which is great. For instance, labor economics has brought to the attention that there is monopsony power also in, in, the, in the markets that we typically do not understand. Uh, privacy experts, computer scientists have helped to, to understand more about digital platforms. Um, the macro trends of, of increases when it comes to markups in lots of markets and the, the, the asymmetric distribution of these increases and in, increases in concentration in markets. There's also a debate whether, you know, corporate greed is part of inflation, but the topic is too hot. We will not consider that uh, tonight. Um, we also learned in the past few years that uh, as a byproduct of the crisis related to U Ukraine, related to energy related to the pandemic that some sectors in our economies are not very resilient and the uh, opposite of resilience is dependence so we heard it in the previous panel so this is a natural continuation so dependence means depending on a few bottlenecks so that's a competition problem we do have bottlenecks in some segments of our economy so how to deal with those bottlenecks is it via as we heard a trade policy is that via uh, industrial policy, is it via competition policy, or the optimal interaction between th those three instruments is what we're going to talk about. And there is a special, uh, a special beast is, is digital markets, because we, it really our digital lives, when it comes to the way we communicate, we interact, we purchase, depend on a handful of American companies. It's typically four or five, and that's about it, that have a, a global... Uh, outreach of uh, three billion customers each, which is something that we, we haven't had in the, in the past. So there is also a political nature of a problem which has gone beyond the jurisdiction of national boundaries. In the past, we knew how to think about large infrastructure which were within national boundaries, but now these boundaries have disappeared, so it's really complex. I'm delighted. Uh, not to give you answers myself, because these are very complex, but I have uh, three incredible speakers on the panel. We have um, Isabel, Isabella de Silva, who's a former enforcer. She was a president of the French Competition Authority, and uh, she's currently at the Conseil d'État here in France. And then we have uh, a Nobel Prize winner you all know about, Jean Tirole from uh, A Toulouse. And then we have a current enforcer, Benoit Curé, who is the current president of the Autorité de la, de la Concurrence, the National Competition Authority in France. I want to start with uh, Isabelle, because now that she's out, she's no more directly involved in competition policy, she can give us really a never, an overview of the many challenges that an enforcer is, uh, is actually facing. And maybe she could also be helpful, because this is an academic audience, to tell us all the various initiatives which are happening at the EU level when it comes to digital. There is, she's going to tell us about something called the DMA, the DSA, the, recently the Artificial Intelligence Act that last week uh, finally passed in Brussels. I'm, I'm also interested to understand since in a few months we will have a new European Commission, to what extent do we think that competition should be a priority of the Commission? Why should they prioritize comp competition over and above something else? So, so I'm interested in these topics from Isabel, and Isabel, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Tommaso. I'm very happy to be here with uh, such a distinguished public of academics and also to, to join Tommaso, with which I had the uh, Pleasure to work for many years. Jean, of course, which we we, we, we met several in several uh, occasions in the past few years, and Benoit, who is now continuing the work at the, the French agency. I would like first to to take a look back and see uh, how in the past few years we have been able to answer some very critical questions uh, related to the issue of digital platforms and competition. And I think that now is a very good time to to look back. Uh, to give us some ideas of what the, the future European Commission could put on its uh, future agenda. And uh, I reflected on the, what I would say today, looking back over the past 10 years, because now 
Uh, I was thinking about Margaret Vestager, and I have a friendly thought for her uh, since she, she didn't get the job that she wanted, but I think that uh, we support her and uh, her return to the European Commission uh, in these days. But also because uh, in the past 10 years, we have seen a major change in the way digital platforms were looked at by the agencies and uh, most importantly, the European Commission, but also at the national level by uh, competition agencies, but also by the academic field, because I think this is one of the fields where academic wor work has been most useful in uh, influencing or giving ideas to enforcers, and not to mention governments and parliaments who have had an important role also. So when we think back about what the situation was 10 years ago, uh, I would say that the, the, you could see many very difficult questions that were raised about competition and digital platforms, and uh, questions that were a bit contradictory, because on the one hand, you would hear people saying that competition agencies were not doing enough, there was not enough enforcement, and since the Microsoft case, nothing was happening uh, in uh, national or European agencies. And at the same time, you had a uh, some very uh, serious pundits that would say it is not necessary to intervene because competition is just one click away and we see growth, we see innovation, so there is no cause to worry about markets uh, and digital markets. And we had many questions about substance. Uh, for example, should we change completely uh, the, the most important notions in competition law, such as abuse of dominance? Should we have new concepts? Should we have new tools, new laws to, to tackle those digital platforms? Uh, and should we change the way we look at them? And since then, I think that we can say that there have been many answers to those different questions. And I would like to select a few to, to try to, to demonstrate that there, there has been a major change since the past 10 years. Of course, we all remember that when Margaret Vestager started her first term as competition commissioner, this was the time of the three big Google, Google cases, so I will not go into the detail because some of you may have heard about them. But uh, the idea that there was no action, no enforcement, I think that could no later uh, be uh, formulated because it was really a, a very massive action with massive fines and uh, uh, also very daring approach in those cases because uh, uh, those were objects that had never been tackled by enforcers. For example, what is an operating system? Uh, does it constitute a relevant market? Uh, can you take into account a digital ecosystem in terms to, to determine whether there's been an abuse of dominance? So there were very novel questions that were answered by those three cases. And uh, this really started a new era, I would say, in competition enforcement. And uh, at the national level, there were also rather uh, interesting or daring cases that answer some of the questions that were raised. To maybe name a few of those questions, for example, how uh, could you take into account two-sided markets? So, of course, the work of Jean Tirole and other academics was very useful, but that remained a theoretical approach. So, enforcers had to take into account those two-sided markets and describe in a very precise manner the way they could be uh, said to be uh, compatible or not with European competition law. Uh, another uh, case I think that uh, is really important and that will lead me to the Digital Market Act is a uh, Google Shopping case and Google Android case. The Google Shopping case because it is the first case really uh, where the whole case has been said to be about self-preferencing so there have been endless legal debates about what was self-preferencing. Uh, that is to say that Google was favoring its own shopping service vis-a-vis -vis other uh, shopping services offered on its platform. Uh, but at that time, it was really an open question whether this was contrary to EU competition law or not. And what we have now is um, we have had now several judgments by the General Court uh, at Luxembourg and also the EU Court of Justice that have said uh, in a very definite manner that self-referencing could be an abuse and that even by changing a web page, uh, you could be uh, causing an abuse of dominance, which was not something that was so obvious some years ago that by changing a very specific algorithm in this Google Shopping page, you were in fact committing an abuse. 
So I think that we are in a very different place now after those different cases and also after the, the judgment by the court. Uh, another maybe not so successful uh, trend I wanted to comment on was the, the, tax, uh, the tax cases because uh, as some of you may know, uh, Margaret Vestager and, and her teams decided that they would use the, the state aid tool to tackle the way in which uh, global companies such as uh, Apple, but also Fiat or other companies in other industries uh, such as the energy, uh, were using the specific regimes of national uh, member states in order to uh, pay the least tax possible. So this was a rather rocky road for the commission because um, the Apple tax case failed uh, at the court of first instance. But there is still hope for the European Commission because we hear that maybe in the end the EU Court of Justice will say that uh, this analysis was correct. What is important about those different cases is that the principle of using state aid law to tackle those very technical specific ways in which companies were avoiding tax by using uh, national regimes. This has been confirmed by the court as being something that was legitimate and compatible with EU law. So this was another very daring approach. Another example of uh, um, enforcement action that was really heavily criticized at the time, but that now is more widely accepted, is taking into account data protection laws. So this was a very famous case in the, in the world of competition uh, by the German competition agency uh, who decided that the way Facebook was using uh, data provided by its user was contrary to competition law and integrated an approach of data protection law to reach this conclusion. So this was really criticized by the, the purist of competition law saying that data protection and data privacy had no relation whatsoever with competition. And in the end, uh, after several decisions by several courts, the EU Court of Justice confirmed that this was not uh, something that was contrary to the European competition law and that this very novel approach could be fully uh, compatible and necessary to, to, to take into account digital platform. So from what I would say, uh, this different instances of uh, very uh, numerous action. Uh, you could think about what the Italian competition authority did about Amazon and the marketplace, or also some other French cases about the related rights and the way Google tried to circumvent the, the directive about related rights. Uh, what we have is a very different landscape today uh, as we had 10 years ago, because now we have uh, a solid jurisprudence about digital platforms, and we now know that we are able, from a legal point of view, uh, to tackle some very specific forms of abuses within those new ecosystem, uh, ecosystem of a smartphone, ecosystem of a, a Google search page, for example. But we also have a more certainty about substance. Uh, Self-preferencing is now something that we know and is clearly uh, uh, contrary to EU law. Uh, and exploitative abuse, which was something that had been abandoned for many years. Uh, this was a notion that really fell very, very well with the way digital platforms are taking, into, uh, are taking advantage of their power. For example, about in a French case where Google was found to be uh, in breach of competition law because of the way they were devising new rules for their business operators and changing them in a very opaque manner and, and, and something that was not uh, transparent enough. So action, substance, and the last thing is tools. And I would like to end with all the different tools that we now have uh, within our hands, and especially Benoit, and uh, what questions those new tools raise for the future. So uh, in terms of new tools for the agency, I would say uh, there are two categories of tools. We have new interpretation of positive law, and uh, this applies very well to mergers because for many years uh, there has been the idea that there was an under-enforcement in mergers, that is to say that many mergers that should have been prohibited were allowed to go through. Uh, Facebook, WhatsApp, or Microsoft, LinkedIn were often cases that were mentioned. And now we have uh, Article 22 of Regulation of 2004, 
Uh, this is a provision that had not been used uh, by, for many years because the Commission decided that it was not something that they would accept. And now uh, agencies are allowed to, to look at mergers that fall below the mandatory uh, notification threshold. So this is a very big change because um, all this talk about killer acquisition, but also acquisitions that allow a, a platform to, to build an ecosystem that cannot be uh, subject to competition. Now, uh, agencies uh, at uh, the European level or national level are able to look at those mergers and they, are, they have started very actively to do so. Uh, another interpretation of a classic tool uh, is the tower cast decision by the EU Court of Justice. Uh, that is to say that the Court of Justice uh, affirmed uh, that uh, a, a simple merger could constitute an abuse of dominance. So that may seem rather esoteric and, and very difficult to understand, but what I think is interesting in this decision is that uh, the courts continue to have a rather wide-ranging view of the law because they are aware that, uh, as Tommaso was mentioning, uh, it is really uh, imperative that uh, the market remain active and competitive uh, and uh, we need, I think, to use all the legal tools uh, as, as much as possible when, of course, they are relevant. And uh, when uh, I will now mention those new tools that have been adopted by, by Europe, uh, it is difficult to, to keep a score of the, of the many new regulations that have been uh, adopted in a very uh, short period of time because over the past two years, we have had the Digital Markets Act, the Digital Services Act, the Data Act, the Data Governance Act, and as of uh, a few hours ago, the Inter Inter Artificial Intelligence Act. So, uh, what can we say about those different acts and, and what questions do those raise for the future? The uh, first question that uh, I would like to raise is uh, the question of time frame. Uh, when is it a good time to regulate and to regulate new developments uh, such as artificial intelligence? We have seen in the debate about the uh, AI Act uh, some members of the business community saying it is much too early to regulate uh, in this field that is changing every day with chat GPT and, and many different users. We should wait to be sure that there is a problem and uh, not to, to, to intervene too early. Uh, so that can be a, a, legitimate, uh, a legitimate point of view. Uh, you also hear uh, the opposite view saying uh, Europe should be the, the first mover, should be the first to regulate because this will enable Europe to, to set the pace and, and then uh, to see uh, the Americans or the Chinese to follow suit. So I think that this is uh, an important debate to have. Uh, another debate is what is the, the, the best regional scope for a regulation? Um, all those regulations that I mentioned are European regulations, so at the level of Europe and also very precise and detailed acts. Uh, when you look at those regulations, you are, you are quite impressed by the complexity of those regulations. They, they, they deal with very specific technical objects such as APIs, uh, interoperability, uh, ecosystem, and even from the legal point of view, they are rather complex. So, so is Europe the, the good place to regulate, uh, or should nations, for example, member states, have um, a, a way to regulate uh, and, and maybe to, to experiment so in some cases? Because in the past, uh, in digital regulation, some uh, member states, such as France, have been first movers and have uh, later inspired uh, Europe. Uh, I would say that is the case for data protection. For example, there was a French law in the 70s that inspired the uh, European Directive uh, and the European Regulation about data protection. So this might be another uh, view uh, of, the, of the relevant scope. Uh, another view is to wait for a multilateral uh, agreement. So maybe that would be difficult uh, to imagine, but I think that we are now uh, in a much better place than uh, even five or ten years ago, because now we have the transatlantic dialogue between Europe and the US about digital platforms that is, I think, doing useful work. Uh, but you also have all the, the global regional forums such as the International Competition Network, the OECD, that are doing also useful work in, in, in putting together or closer the, the position of the different member, members in terms of digital platforms. Uh, still, um, 
we uh, often talk about the Brussels effect. Uh, it will be interesting to see if, for example, the Artificial Intelligence Act uh, leads to this Brussels effect in, for example, uh, uh, inspiring the US uh, in devising their own regulation. And uh, another uh, issue that is raised is um, maybe my final question. What is the objective uh, that you should uh, define for those regulations and how can you uh, write and devise those regulations? Uh, the question of the objective is not so obvious because, uh, for example, uh, competition uh, policy, uh, its objective is defined by the Treaty of Rome and it has not changed a lot since uh, 1957. But when you take the Artificial Intelligence Act, you have two very conflicting objectives that are stated explicitly in the text. You have, we want, we want to have a very strong AI industry in Europe, so we want to build something that is very open to innovation and, and create new European giants. But you have other conflicting objectives, that is, we want to protect our societies and avoid, for example, social rating like they do in China. So uh, this was the whole problem of the AI, AI Act. How do you deal with those conflicting, conflicting objectives? And the final issue that is maybe not often underlined enough, uh, I would say is the issue of expertise. Uh, how can um, agencies or governments regulate artificial intelligence if they are not fully uh, aware of what happens uh, in those uh, AI firms and how it works, uh, to, to put it rather bluntly? So this is something on which uh, I and my colleagues worked a lot uh, over the past few years to, to, to try to convince uh, governments that we needed budget and expertise. But I think it's still an issue uh, that is relevant today because uh, we reach uh, technologies of such complexity that in order to understand them and intervene, you have the, the use of uh, market studies like the one that the Autorité did recently on the cloud. But it is really a race to keep up to date and to be fully aware of what is happening in the digital field and whether it is necessary to intervene. Thank you. Thank you, Isabel. Thank you very much. That was very inspiring and very clear. And I'm also glad that you mentioned uh, that we didn't coordinate the three Google cases because they bring some memory. I was the chief economist in charge of those three cases. And I'm glad to say that the economic analysis survived all the legal challenges that went through the various courts so far, but also reflecting on our experience, we did not devote enough time on the remedies. So we devoted a lot of time proving there was harm, abuse of dominance and consumer harm, but once you prove it, what do you want Google to do? And this is something that the commission didn't say because legally it was not something that economists would do. You would say cease and desist doing it. You have to stop doing it. But then what? And for instance, to, to my knowledge, I'm not falling too much uh, these, these days any longer, but the Google shopping case finished in 2017. So we are six years down the road. And as far as I know, the commission hasn't formally accepted the remedies yet. And so that, which tells to you as a, a scientific community that we need help on designing good remedies once you find, if you find abuse of dominance. Another thing that perhaps is useful because we mentioned Google and Facebook and, uh, and Apple, so it looks like competition authorities are going after only American firms, which is not the case. Obviously when it comes to digital, uh, we are in a different space, but again, to mention a few cases uh, that were very large at the European level, one of the biggest uh, cartel that was found was German car manufacturers that were not competing to, to, to bring, uh, uh, to reduce emissions on the, on, uh, on the market. Another merger that was, that I, I contributed to, blo to blocking and France wasn't very happy was uh, Alstom Siemens, for instance, this creation of a European champion at the time when Europe already had two European champions and we said you, we don't want to reduce uh, that. So there were also big cases against European companies. Um, Isabel mentioned something about the objectives, and this leads naturally to what Jeanne wants to talk about, which is a discussion which has been going on on the consumer welfare standard, that, that is, what do we do, what do we want competition authorities to look at, and historically they've been looking mostly at static price effects to the effect to the extent that people became dissatisfied. They said, this is very narrow, it's too small, what do we do with that, okay? Shall we throw it away and replace it with something else? Some people propose to make it more complex or more sophisticated to bring in additional uh, elements, which was my original position, which I revised over time, because if you add complexity to a tough job, you're gonna mess up even more, so we need to bring 
you know, robust and useful economics into this, this approach, not complex, because uh, you have limited time to do that. You don't have the, the benefit from spending too much time. But Jean wants to tell us uh, about, and he has a presentation which I will put precisely about this topic. So Jean, socially responsible agencies. Okay. Voila. Can you hear me? Yeah. Well, first of all, thanks, thanks for inviting me. I really appreciate this. Um, and I'm going to start from the point of view that actually uh, lots of people are asking uh, independent agencies actually to um, do more than just what they are supposed to do. So they should embrace things like climate change or inequality, which are, of course, incredibly important issues. Uh, we don't know quite where it comes from. It may be the fact that uh, you know, the public opinion is desperate with politicians who don't act on those things and they're asking uh, agencies to do it. Maybe the agency itself is embracing it because, maybe because they want to build the empire, maybe because they want to avoid a dodge interference. Maybe it's just a welcome opening to our key societal problems, I don't know. So what I'm going to do is to talk a little bit about two agencies which are really already in the political terrain and might get more into the political terrain, then I'll take the high ground and just uh, think about the economics of missions and I'll discuss uh, competition is equal behavior very quickly. Um, so I have to juggle with two, <laughs> I'm not very good at that. So let's start with central banks. It's, a very, it's not of course a topic of this session, but uh, traditionally they've had very narrow missions. Uh, inflation targets, financial stability. Of course, with the financial crisis, the Eurozone crisis, COVID and so on, they have gone much further than that and they have gone into the fiscal domain, for example, um, which is also dangerous because if there had been uh, problems with that, then they might, their independence might be, have been jeopardized. Uh, but today there are many calls for central banks to take on, for example, climate change responsibilities. Um, so, integrating climate risk into a stress test, for example, is a no-brainer. It's already in the mission of the central bank. It's a huge macro shock, either the climate risk itself or the policy response to the climate risk. Um, but what about relaxing prudential standards uh, for climate-friendly lending? Somehow, people don't talk about raising uh, prudential standards for, uh, for those who have brown, who have brown holdings. Uh, what about purchasing green bonds to reduce their spread? I mean, are we going to manufacture the next subprime, subprime crisis? Um, so, uh, let me... There are, there are several issues. There are at least three issues. Uh, the first is the lack of legitimacy. That can be taken care of at this stage. The central bank is not meant to do that, but you could have the governments giving the right to the central bank to address climate change, fine. It's a bit bizarre because, of course, the politicians don't want to act on climate change. I mean, they, of course, say they want to, but you know, they don't react on climate change, and then they ask an independent agency to do the job. Um, most importantly, there is a lack of capability. Uh, so the central bank will need to be endowed with a staff to verify emissions. It will, be en it will have to be endowed with the right instruments. And by the way, the two big instruments that I'm thinking of is uh, carbon pricing and disruptive innovation. I don't, I don't see the European Central Bank doing that or the Fed. And um, then run, you know, cost-benefit analysis. You, know, want, you want an effective climate policy, not greenwashing, and so on. So it's, it's, hard, it's hard to actually sustain the central bank should be doing that. Also, I can see the argument that if nobody does it, works on it, then basically the climate the central bank could be a climate change fight of last resort. Um, let's come back to what we are talking about, which is um, uh, competition policy. So in the past, when I grew up, a while ago, you know, we were discussing the left side of, uh, of this diagram. So, you know, a series had no qualms. We basically wrote welfare equals consumer surplus plus a fraction between zero and one of the, of the profit. Now, then there was a practical debate about uh, you know, whether you should put more or less weight on profit and the arguments pro or against. In the end, 
it was decided to have a consumer startup basically putting all the weight, with, you know, with caveats, of course, and of course with IP law, we don't do that, but, you know, by and large, there is this idea that uh, we should put much more weight on the consumer, and I have nothing uh, to argue against that. But the new Brandazian movement is actually changing things in a different direction, basically suggesting that the competition authority, Benoit should be, and Isabel before, before Benoit and Thomas before, was, uh, was also in charge of uh, solving unemployment, uh, looking at worker wages, taking care of communities, looking at politics, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, so, so that's a question, and sh you know, should, we have, should we have this? And that's a big, uh, that's something we're going to discuss. Um, Let's, sorry. Um, no, I went back. Okay. Uh, so let's think a little bit about uh, the optimal response to what is really a twin market and political failures. Think about the environment or the inequality. There is clearly a market failure, and market is not going to solve an externality or insurance behind the veil of ignorance. And there is a huge political failure as well. So what is left? Um, so that suggests that it should be right, actually, to ask agencies, competition authorities, but also central banks, also any kinds of agency, and courts as well, by the way. Why not courts? To actually embrace a very broad mandate, not, not a simple mission. Now, that's something that um, political scientist J.Q. Wilson wrote about a about, long time ago. Um, and he was noticing, that's easy to notice, that government agencies, uh, the people there work mainly in, in terms of legacy or career concerns. They have a multiplicity of objectives. Think about prime minister, for example. You know, you have lots of objectives. It's pretty fuzzy in general. You don't get a dollar thing like a stock price or, or a profit uh, revenue. Um, and they have limited autonomy as well uh, for government agencies. So his view, J.Q. Wilson's view, was that it's actually very important to have a simple mind and a simple, to do a simple thing. Um, so develop a sense of mission, avoid vague objectives, set some critical task, uh, like, you know, like consumer standard or something like that. And you create an agency culture, you hire specialist, narrow-minded people like us, uh, and you hire specialists, uh, and uh, by the way, you have more PhDs um, in those agencies or in the central bank or wherever than you have in ministries, and basically resist the enlargement of tasks. Now, why is that? Uh, what may go wrong with multi-factor missions? And the first thing is obvious. Too many cooks may spoil the boss. Uh, in the end, if everybody's in charge, of climate, so the Ministry of the Environment, the Central Bank, the Competition Authority, every court in the country and abroad, um, who is in charge? I mean, who is responsible for that? Uh, so there is an issue there, and you have to ask, do they have the proper instruments? So do they all have a carbon price? Do they all have disruptive innovation programs and the like? I mean, it doesn't just doesn't make sense to have too many cooks. You need someone to be accountable for it. And then there is the issue about the threat to independence. So one of the wonderful things we have done collectively, I think, in the past is to have independent agencies. You know, I think central banks and, and competition authorities are much stronger since they have become independent. And of course, they are, they are never independent. But they, they, have, they have become stronger since the 80s. But then, you know, if they get it too much into the political domain, then they, will, they are exposed to be losing independence. Um, so, who do you want to subsidize with your green lending? Should the central bank, the European Central Bank, deny lending to Germany because Germany produces more than France in the power sector? You know, well, how, do you, how, do you, how do you deal with all those things? I mean, it becomes totally political at some point. And actually, independence requires limited and mandated power. But then um, agencies may not function well either. And it's pretty obvious in the case where it's, it has to do incompatible tasks. Uh, I give an example on the slide, but 
you know, they are undefined, in, undefined expectations. So how do you all these agencies accountable if their mission is vague? You know, you will have to put weights on the various criteria and measure uh, the contribution to each of those goals. Uh, and even if you do that, actually multi-factor mission generators are incentive issues. That's something we, we did with um, Mathias de Watripo and Ian Jewitt a long time ago. We argued basically that uh, if you have too many tasks, um, grasp all, lose all. So, you know, that's, that's a dangerous thing. So, the bottom line, and I don't want to take too much time, but is that, you know, there's a good, there's a good uh, aspect to mission agency, oriented agencies. They are narrow-minded, they are effective, their management is accountable, and it, it cannot take refuge in a correct or invented pursuit. Sorry, you don't have the rights. Do you have the right slide? No, of course not. No, is that, is that economics of mission? I cannot see. Mm, okay. Okay. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Okay, that's the one. Sorry. Um, so, you know, th their management is accountable. You cannot just invent a new mission just to get away and, you know, just uh, not be accountable at all. Um, of course, there are, you have unforeseen contingencies. You know, the mission is not always perfect and actually approve of those new mission of the competition authority, or, or some of them at least. Uh, same thing, I approve the central bank when it went way beyond the price stability and so on. Uh, policies during uh, COVID, during the uh, financial and, uh, and European crisis, okay? But I, I would not say climate change and inequality are quite unforeseen. Um, okay, so, you know, the preference for an economist, in my view, is to use the right instrument, better targeted, um, and not, not, you know, the government should basic, basically be accountable. And I understand the argument, you know, um, but, you know, we have to work on making the government accountable, and we don't want to encourage backpassing to many, many different agencies and courts, we, which in the end are not going to be able to do it. Okay, just a last word which is a reassurance about competition. There are lots of non-economists who actually claim that uh, competition leads to amoral behavior. Um, and that's something I've, I've written with Mathias de Watripo on. Um, I would like to say that actually there's a little grain of truth in this argument of those people who don't want competition and there are very specific circumstances under which actually competition is going to hinder the morality of suppliers. So if the suppliers have social preferences, they won't be able to express those social preferences in the marketplace because they will be immediately replaced by somebody else if the consumers actually want immoral behavior. And it turns out they may want immoral behavior, like when official demands a bribe, when dictator buy weapons, when patients wants to consume opioids, um, when there is disclosure issues where you, you have to disclose the flows of your products. Uh, but in general, there is no notion that competition per se is going to reduce moral behavior at all, and actually sometimes it may increase moral behavior. So it, it just, uh, since I have many competition uh, authority people and uh, academic in the field, in the room, and in this, on this round table, I just want to reassure you, reassure you a little bit on the need for competition. It's, it's real, more or less orthogonal. Okay, uh, well, that's it. Thank you, Jean. Thank you very much. I will now turn to Benoit. Many of you know Benoit because he held, uh, is a, is held an important policy position with the European Central Bank, the Bank of International Settlements, and now the French Competition Authority. So you have, uh, you're more of a macro person, but now you know inside out also the mm. micro aspects of, of competition. A, a couple of questions for you. you. I don't know if you can answer both or whatever you like. One, one is, Isabel gave us this vision about digital markets, putting Europe at the center. So what's left for, for, for you, for the French competition authority? And secondly, also, it would be interesting because the previous session was on, also on industrial policy. So I'm really interested in your views on this interaction between competition policy and industrial policy, where 
for many years, industrial policy among economics was almost a bad word, no? and now instead there is lots of rethinking, mm, Danny Roderick and others, etc. But, but is, is there a, <coughs> an, an interaction between these two instruments? Yeah, thank you. <coughs> thank you, Tommaso, and uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I was thinking, Tommaso, that you're really a very brave person, because setting up a, a, a panel on competition with uh, three French speakers is a kind of a risky bet. Uh, especially coming after another panel on, on economic sovereignty. <laughs> so you're, you're kind of tempting us. Okay, so um, I, uh, before answering your questions, Tommaso, I would, if I may, just say, uh, just react very shortly to what Jean just said. And, and then I'm going to answer Tommaso, and basically what I'm going to do is to follow up on Isabel and maybe based on everything Isabel said, which I agree, uh, uh, address a few um, uh, questions or issues for the future, for the next term of the Commission and Parliament, <coughs> based on, on the achievements that, that uh, Isabel uh, 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 outlined. But, but first to, to Jean, I was, uh, what you said, Jean, is really, uh, was really music to my ears, uh, because it, it resonates very much to my, uh, with my experience, uh, both at the ECB and, and now uh, in a, um, as an antitrust enforcer. Uh, I mean, the relation, when you're, when you're running an independent, uh, an independent agency, uh, you always feel that uh, that politicians are coming with a uh, kind of uh, passive-aggressive uh, stance, where uh, when you do what you have to do, that is cutting rates or raising rates or uh, enforcing uh, enforcing competition, they're not so happy. Um, but then they always come to you with like ten many ten 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 additional things you would they would like you to do because they don't want to do it because it would be just too, too politically costly for them to do it. So that was the case in the Eurozone crisis, and uh, I, will, I will sometimes feel, feel, feel it also in, uh, in, uh, in antitrust. So it's good to have your uh, framework, Jean, to uh, help us resist uh, in the name of uh, reason uh, and science. Uh, I'll try to do that. Um, that said, of course, um, our legal mandate is probably broader than you would think. Uh, and uh, for instance, in the French law, uh, as, as Isabel knows very well, uh, you can possibly allow a merger in the name of economic progress, le progrès économique. What does it mean? Uh, we don't know. And uh, to be sure that we would, we would not have to answer that question, we've set the standard so high that we're, we are actually never doing that. Um, but uh, we could. Uh, and so there is, a, there, is a legal, there is some legal space to, to go beyond consumer welfare and to broaden the, uh, the, the scope. Uh, and then it's a matter of judgment uh, whether you want to do it or not. It's not as, you know, the mandate is not that narrow. Uh, uh, and, and it gives some space. And also, there are some uh, higher requirements in the EU treaty. Article 11 of the treaty says that uh, uh, um, um, sustainability uh, uh, and uh, protecting the environment uh, should be an overarching uh, objective for all EU policies, of which competition is one. It is an EU policy. And so the treaty also tells us that we do have to account uh, to, to, uh, to, to bring on board that kind of considerations. Uh, uh, and then you have a discussion on proportionality, which you can solve yourself, and see only the uh, EU Court of Justice at some point could, uh, could, uh, could adju adjudicate it. But, but it's, so it's, there is some room to have that discussion. Now, um, coming more narrowly to, uh, to antitrust, uh, and again, as I said, I, uh, I mean, uh, I think uh, Isabel was, was brilliant, you know, explaining everything that has been achieved. And so what I'm, I'm, I'm what I'm going, what I would like to do is just to outline a, uh, maybe two or three uh, big questions which I think the next commission will have to uh, think about and take a view on when it comes to competition. Um, and the first one is about, and straight to your point, Tommaso, that's about the, uh, the right uh, articulation between competition and, and industrial policy. Um, and I'm not saying, uh, on purpose, I'm not saying the right balance because I'm not sure there is a balance here. Uh, it's more about an articulation, how to use, how, how to combine the two uh, instruments. Um, the, um, I think the, the commission will have to make a strong case that there is no trade-off between competition and industrial policy, uh, that uh, as, much as, as much as competition should not stand in the way of industrial policy, uh, industrial policy has to be more pro-competitive, and that has to be uh, kind of uh, 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 hardwired into the way we do, we do uh, industrial policy, um, which is today not always the case. 
uh, and part particularly not the case when you, uh, if, we, if we keep doing industrial policy through, uh, through state aid at a national level. Because we, I think it's, it's now well known in the public discussion that, uh, and it's, an, it's a lively discussion in Europe, that if we keep the temporary state aid framework as it is, uh, we will keep doing industrial policy at a national level with national money. <clears throat> That's bad for the single market. It creates fragmentation in the single market. 80% uh, of the state aids uh, allowed by the Commission uh, under the temporary framework uh, are going to France and Germany, 80%. So that makes the point that, you know, that's going to fragment the, 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 uh, the single market, uh, maybe in a, uh, in a, in a fatal way. Um, and uh, also it, uh, it, uh, it strains uh, national budgets at a time where debt is already high. Uh, and, uh, and it turns into the discussion on industrial policy and a discussion on fiscal policy, which is really not the place you want to be. Really, you don't want to be there. Uh, discussions on fiscal poli policy are always toxic. Uh, in Europe, we never know how to solve them, so you don't want industry, the future of, the, uh, of uh, Europe and growth to depend on that. Um, and so, of course, we know the, uh, uh, that one way out is to have European instruments to fund, uh, to fund uh, industrial policy. Uh, it's very easy to say that on a panel at Sciences Po <laughs> at, at 7 p.m. We know that there is very little political appetite uh, in member states, or uh, in, 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 in major member states, uh, even less so after the, uh, the decision of the, uh, of the German Constitutional Court on the, on the German budget. Uh, but we'll, we'll, have to, we'll have to confront this, that we need European funding for, for industrial policy. Um, and uh, we, need, we need to complete the single market. You, need, you, need, you want the market to be European. Uh, and so there is often this discussion, including here, or maybe primarily here in France, that if you want to support industrial policy, you've got to, uh, to tweak our competition policy and change the definition of relevant markets to make them broader, um, because if, if, any, if any relevant market is European or global, uh, you, can, you, can, uh, uh, you can allow for more mergers and there will be more uh, European champions. I think that's exactly the wrong way to look at it. Uh, you've got to, uh, uh, the, the relevant markets have to follow the reality of the market. So first integrate markets, and when markets are integrated, then compet competition uh, authorities naturally uh, will adapt to, to the reality of the market and, uh, and will decide based on the European market. Uh, but you can't decide on the European, you can't, you, can't, you can't allow a merger uh, uh, based on the false pretense that it's a European market if the market is national. And that's true in telecoms, that's true in audiovisual, that's true in energy, and, and, and so on. And why am I uh, mentioning this on, in a panel on competition? Because if we keep doing industrial policy at a national level, it's also, it's, it's, we, it's inevitable that it collides with competition. Because we are going to, uh, member states want to have national champions at a national level, which is understandable, I mean, that they are nationally elected politicians, so it's only normal that they would think that way. Um, and if you want to have uh, national champ champions emerge at a national level, you've got to weaken competition. So you're bound to have a conflict between industrial policy and competition. The only way to, uh, uh, to go beyond this conflict and, and reconcile industrial policy and competition is to elevate the discussion at a European level uh, on a, across a broader market, which is why uh, the uh, the aspiration to complete the single market is so important, and why the, the reports that will be put forward by uh, Enrico Letta and, uh, and Mario Draghi uh, will be so important uh, uh, next year. So that's the first thing, competition and industrial policy. And the second, I think, key question uh, the future uh, competition commissioner will have to, 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 to think about is about uh, articulating different instruments, and particularly what belongs to competition, what belongs to antitrust enforcement, and what belongs to regulation. Isabel mentioned the, the series of texts that have been voted recently, uh, started with GDPR, of course, long ago, uh, and more recently the DMA, DSA, Data Act, uh, uh, Data Governance Act, uh, and, 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 and so on, which is all regulation. Uh, and so it's, it's, uh, it's ex ante, while our, our antitrust is ex post. And, and here you will have, a, they will have a really, a, a there is a choice to be made, do you want to build on this and extend the scope of um, ex ante regulation to make it more forward-looking, more forward-leaning, more to make it uh, to quicker to uh, to capture uh, technological change in the market? So, do you want to uh, do you want to use the, uh, the DMA, for instance, to capture cloud services um, 
uh, uh, artificial intelligence and whatever else will be invented uh, next year, which we don't know yet. Um, and then, of course, there is a trade-off because it's not tested uh, and, uh, and there will be a kind of uh, uh, in inherent uh, uh, conservatism or sluggishness inside the commission. I'm sure the commission legal service will, will hate what, I'm going, what, what I just said and will say, let's have these, these instruments tested. Let's wait until it goes up the way, uh, uh, all the way up to the, uh, to the tribunal and to the court of justice. And then we will know what works and what doesn't work. And that takes like, I don't know, 15 years, 20 years. Um, uh, if, um, if, we, if we don't do that, then uh, there are bright prospects for antitrust, Tomaso, <laughs> uh, 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 both at European level and, and national level. That is any new uh, conduct, uh, any new industry, any new um, player, and any player which actually is not designated as a gatekeeper under the DMA will continue to be addressed by, uh, by antitrust. Uh, and we are actually preparing for this because I'm not, I'm not putting my, uh, my money on the first scenario, you see. <laughs> so we've started to investigate, uh, to investigate uh, AI. I mean, it's public information that we, we did a donor raid uh, with a, uh, I'm, I think I'm probably not allowed to give the name here, so uh, a very big global company active in uh, GPU um, uh, chips for uh, both artificial intelligence and cloud services. So we did a donor rate that uh, a donor rate there to to investigate some uh, some uh, some practices. Well, I'm not passing a judgment, of course, too early, uh, but that's the let's say the upstream value chain of uh, of AI. Same for cloud services, on which, uh, as Isabel said, we issued a uh, a market study uh, earlier this year, uh, and so we are preparing to take this active role at the at the fringe at the periphery of the DMA. Uh, which maybe one day will be brought back into the DMA, but probably not very, not very, not, 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 not very fast. Uh, maybe one, one last, uh, one last, uh, and there are lots of nitty-gritty issues that the next commission will have to solve. Uh, the, uh, we, already, we already have uh, underway a, uh, an evaluation of uh, Regulation 1, 2003, which is about the way competition works, the way the European Competition Network work, works, what does the commission do? What do national agencies do, et cetera? It's a very important discussion. It's more technical, but it's very important. Uh, and also a, um, a discussion around uh, uh, possible guidelines for um, exclusionary conduct under Article 102, that is abuse of dominance, uh, where there are lots of uh, also uh, issues to be, um, lessons to be learned from, uh, from, 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 from practice, particularly from decisions from the, the Court of Justice. And in particular, when it comes to uh, the way uh, the effect-based approach to uh, ex exclusionary conduct, uh, that might seem very arcane, but it's very important for competition economists because that's uh, uh, really about the way you show the effects. Uh, and there is a lot of, uh, as, as all uh, competition economists know in this room, there is a lot of uh, uh, research and modeling, uh, particularly around the, uh, the um, uh, as efficient competitor test. So that will, that will kind of test the relationship between, between IO economics and competition in a, in a, very, in a very practical way. Uh, maybe my last point here is about uh, international cooperation because the whole, the whole the, narrati the political narrative of this commission, and I'm pretty sure this will be the political narrative of the next commission, is um, we are here, we are standing for European sovereignty, we are a geopolitical commission, uh, etc., uh, with a sense that we, we want to protect our industry, we want to protect our citizens. Um, so, which is really ironic from a, as seen from, a, from, a, from, a, from, a, from an antitrust person, because the, uh, the project is we want, to, we want to build our walled garden with our, and, and our moated castle, you know, which is exactly what we've tried to, to, to fight against uh, in, uh, in antitrust in the last, in the last 10 years. Um, and that, there are lots of good reasons to, 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 to say this, but there is a risk that uh, this comes at the expense of, uh, of international coordination on, uh, on, on antitrust enforcement, which remains very much needed. We are dealing with global companies. The practices are the same everywhere. Uh, when we have a, whenever we have a discussion among enforcers on, say, AI, we, we, we're having the same discussion. It's the same practices, the same risks that we see. Um, uh, exclusion, tying, uh, bundling, uh, 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 excluding competitors from access to data. We are seeing the same risks everywhere. The technology is, a, is the same, so we need to be able to get together and discuss. And we have these big merger cases where uh, we, we need cooperation between enforcers 
and when they when it doesn't work, uh, it's very apparent. Uh, you know, uh, when the uh, U.S., U.K., and EU don't uh, don't take the same decision with the same remedies, the industry is confused, and rightly so. So that's really some, something we should be trying to avoid. But uh, so the uh, what my, my plea for the next commission is: yes, you should stand for European sovereignty. Yes, we should. Uh, 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 stop being naive. Uh, yes, we should uh, uh, enforce a level playing field with, with non-European companies, but let's let's try not to do it at the expense of international cooperation. So, of course, I don't know if, if Mr. Trump is re-elected, the whole multilateral framework might be blown away, and that will be a different discussion. But uh, I'm, I'm kind of uh, in the uh, in the baseline scenario when uh, where this doesn't happen. I stop here. Thank you very much, Benoit. Thanks a lot, and. Um, it's two minutes to seven o'clock since, since Isabel was the first one to talk and uh, now you have the benefit of having heard the other guys. I will allow you to finish and, uh, and conclude the panel for tonight. Thank you, Tommaso. Uh, I think, like Benoit, that the power of international network uh, cannot be really uh, undervalued and um, it is critical. I always say that uh, to regulate platforms, you need to act uh, like a platform and, and use the benefit of all the resources, cooperation between agencies, cooperation between Europe and the US. The US is following the lead of Europe in terms of enforcement. The UK is having its own uh, digital platform regulation that should be adopted in the next few days. So we are much more convergent than we were uh, 10 years ago. And uh, on the issue that uh, Jean raised about uh, the social mandate of agencies and should they have a broader mandate, I think that there is a strong push uh, even within the agencies, for example, to tackle climate change because uh, uh, the, the board members or, or the young uh, people working at the agencies also want to contribute to this. So I think it's something we must take into account. And I think that there are some very legitimate way to take into account this climate change objective within our own remit and objective. And we have had, for example, a case in 2017 where we uh, identified a, a breach of competition that at the sam same time was a, a damage to the environment. So I think that there are some intelligent ways to, uh, to kill two birds with the same stone uh, without... Uh, going in all different directions, like uh, Benoit was saying, because uh, I know that agencies are, are at the end of a lot of demands and hopes and the requests that are not always legitimate. So you should keep on resisting the <laughs> doing too many things at the same time. Thank you. Join me. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Uh, my turn? Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. Uh, yes, killing two birds with the same stone, that's the easy case, right? Uh, when it, it's the same thing with uh, data protection and competition policy, so sometimes they perfectly coincide, so it's a no-brainer. The question is when they disagree, then you have to put a price on carbon and all those things. You, you, need, and that, you know, that's uh, the thing. Uh, the, I, would be, I would be fine, at least, you know, if there were a price on carbon uh, and, you know, of 100 euros at least, and then the, the agencies could demonstrate that it has economized X, X tons of carbon. That would be perfectly fine with me. But otherwise, it's a little bit complicated. Um, on the, yeah, I, I like the Brussels effect, actually. I, you know, I don't always agree with everything which is written in the, all those things. Um, but nonetheless, you know, the, the fact it's not going to come from the US or China, and for good reason, they totally dominate the, the, the industry. So. You know, I, I, we need the Brussels effect. On, on competition policy, I think uh, Benoit said it all. Uh, let me just say that uh, we need to, you know, I mean, let me add that we need a good governance, uh, which we don't know how to do in Europe. I mean, even things like the European Innovation Council, which first doesn't do really disruptive innovation, which we need for climate change, uh, and a few other things. Uh, it's no DARPA, and the governance is still uh, political and all those things. So, you know, we just don't know how to deal with this. And I agree totally that we should be done at the European level. Uh, at the national level, the, the lobbies are so strong that, uh, you know, we've definitely we should first integrate markets. I'm just uh, saying the same thing. A last word on self-referencing. Um, there, you know, it, it seems like it's all the 
with a, it's a two-sided market version of what we already knew in the 90s. You know, when we were dealing with telecom and power, you know, and, and railroads, it was all about foreclosure. It was not called self-referencing, but so in a sense, and, and I think everybody will agree, we don't need new laws, we don't need new, new concept. We need actually new economics to know how to measure those things and how to implement those things. And that's, I think, what is important. Thank you, Jean, thank you. And before Beatrice kills me, I will give 30 seconds to Benoit. <laughs> and then it's, you can just a, uh, it's just a promotional sequence. Since uh, Jean mentioned uh, several times the, uh, the links between our uh, privacy, data privacy and competition, uh, just wanted to say that uh, tomorrow we have a, an excellent conference together with the, uh, the, the French uh, Data Protection Authority, like CNIL, uh, with lots of great speakers, including Jean himself uh, and uh, Jean-Noël Barreau, who's a, who's a friend of CEPR. Uh, and that will be webcasted. So, of course, it's competing with the CPR symposium, but who's against competition? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everybody, again. Thank you.